And so if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Mark 11. That's where we're going to start. And uh, before I get into it a little bit, you may have seen the title of the message is Making Your Mark. Okay. And so uh, just to give you a little bit of understanding, it might be clear, but basically when we have lives, the things that we live, the things that we do, we make an impact on this earth. And we have the choice of what kind of impact we're going to make. We could have no impact whatsoever. We can have an impact in a way that kind of gears people away from Jesus. Or we can have an impact that gears people towards Jesus. Okay, so those are kind of the choices that we have. And uh, I just wanted to share, I was, I was invited to a birthday party recently, and they played a, a, a board game, which was, was pretty cool. Um, I don't want to advertise the game, but basically you have to help your team guess some words. And the trick with this game is the other team is trying to guess words too. So you can only give one clue, it's a one word clue. And, but the idea is you want to give enough information in that clue so your team can pick the words for your team and not pick the words for the other team. Okay, very simple. Well, I was playing, and uh, I'm actually not very good at those kind of games, so um, I really like to be competitive and to win and stuff, but I think I ended up giving more clues for the, for the other team <laughs> instead of my own team. So I, uh, unfortunately, I left a mark on my team that they don't really want me as teammates anymore. So, and uh, I guess the true test will be as if I get invited back to any more parties, and, uh, and I haven't been since, so I kind of think, you know, uh, that's probably it. But it was a birthday, so I won't really know until 2020. So, um, <laughs> You know, with uh, with my daughter, you know, and our kids, we take them back and forth to school, right? And um, we're just fortunate where our elementary school is like within a mile from where we live, so it's really easy to get there. It's like three minutes drive, and you know, and the school is so small, it's like you pick them up and go. So it only takes like ten minutes. But last week it had some really good weather. You know, it wasn't you know two thousand degrees like it normally is, and so I was like, hey, I'm gonna walk. And, uh, you know, it takes a little bit longer to walk. Um, it doesn't take 10 minutes, you know, to go back and forth. So it took me about 20 minutes. And when I was walking, I was noticing that there's a lot of stuff in my neighborhood I've never seen before. You know, because, you know, when you're driving, you're just like, zoom, you're focused right there, you know, in that road, just trying not to hit that car or that person or whatever. But when you're walking, you can see all kinds of stuff. You know, and I was like, man, there's horses over there. Because they like to hide way in the corner where it's shady. They don't come out to the street and say hello or anything. You know, they're kind of way back there. And then, like, in this road, there's just a bunch of bridges and stuff. And um, so I was, you know, I was just like, wow, this is pretty cool. And then I realized, too, you know, it took me quite a bit longer. It was, instead of 10 minutes, it was about 40 minutes round trip. I don't walk very fast, but it is a little hilly, so give me a break, okay? And, um, and, I, and I was like, man, so I must be working out pretty good, too. So I was like, well, how much calories am I burning? And so round trip, it's about 200 calories. And I was like, Ooh. I was like, that's about a cookie, you know, so that's like, uh, and I, I'm not even a sweets guy, so it doesn't really help me, okay, but I thought it has to be more than a cookie that I burn here, okay, but my whole point in that is, as you know, as you're walking and you're taking time, uh, I think we can do that with the Bible too. We can read and kind of go full speed and just look straight ahead, and then we just miss all this other stuff. And so my hope today is we'll go a little bit slower, and maybe we'll stop and smell the roses, if you will, right? We're going to see a little bit of the details. So, so let's get into the scripture a little bit. So in Mark 10, or sorry, Mark 11, uh, Pastor just taught us on Mark 10 recently, uh, last week, of course. And um, several things happened, but one of the last pieces was he healed blind Bartimaeus. And that's just a, a telltale sign of Jesus and who he is, how he... Um, he just comes and he performs miracles, right? He changes things. So Bartimaeus was blind and now he can see. He resurrected Lazarus, right? He, he, there's a, a blind man, and, I mean a, a mute man, and, and he was able to allow him to speak. And, and he casts out demons. And so Jesus has come the whole time demonstrating his spiritual authority, that he truly is the Son of God. But if you really pay attention, you'll notice that Jesus himself doesn't have this sign that says, hey, I'm the Son of God, come follow me. He's just saying, look at what I do, and, and you make the decision. Right? He kind of lets you decide. And um, that's going to change a little bit as we get into Mark 11. He's going to be a little bit more upfront. Um, and so what's also interesting about Mark 11 is this is kind of the starting on the road to the cross. Okay, We're starting the Holy Week. We're starting um, you know, basically with Palm Sunday. And uh, for those of you guys, who, if it's not obvious enough, the end of the week is where he gets crucified. Okay, So we're, we're building up to that. Uh, to that event. And so as we're reading this, I, I hope what you can see is there's more tension being, like things are coming to a climax. There's more tension that's happening. And uh, so hopefully we'll see that. So I'm going to go into, start reading just a, a couple verses uh, in Mark 11. So, and this is called, at least in my Bible, it has a triumphal entry. So you guys may be familiar with that. So verse 1. Now when they, de when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and to Bethany, 
at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, Go into the village in front of you. And immediately, because Mark likes to use immediately all the time, as you enter it, uh, into it, you will find a colt tied, one which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it. And we'll send it back here immediately. Okay, so I just want you guys to think about, so this is a cult. It's never been ridden before. And it's not Jesus's. So is he like stealing a brand new car right now? What do you guys think? He's like, he's like, yeah, he's, well, okay, he did say borrow. So he's probably going to bring it back, okay? But not only that, he didn't, he didn't actually steal it, right? He told, he told his disciples to go do it, right? I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of rough. Okay, so, so if Jesus asks you to steal a car, don't do it, okay? Just don't do it. That's not what he's saying here, okay? But I think also what's interesting, too, is when you think about, uh, and we're building up here to the triumphal entry, but when you think of a donkey, does that give you a different image of a horse? Right, those are two different things. A horse is not a donkey, right? I mean, they're close, but they're not. So when you think of a horse, you think more like a warrior, right? You think of somebody who's coming in to dominate. Someone's going to go into battle and to war. But when you think of a, don a donkey, that's more of an animal of peace. That's more of like, I've already conquered, right? It's kind of like, um, I, I have already conquered. You know, there's, I'm not going into war. I'm kind of celebrating I'm already in power, right? There's, there's some imagery here that I think it's subtle, but we want to we wanna catch it. Okay, but now the reality is Jesus did not, he didn't conquer nations, right? He didn't go out and battle wars. He didn't go against the Roman government. He didn't go against all these other uh, countries that are around him. But he was doing battle. He was doing spiritual battle, right? He was casting out demons. It was the kingdom of God versus what I like to say is, it's not really even the kingdom of Satan, but it's just darkness, right? It's light versus darkness. And so essentially, he's, he's going on a spiritual battle, battle of war, but it's, it's of hearts and minds. It's, it's a spiritual thing. It's not a physical thing. So, um, I, you know, I want to read to you from uh, Zechariah 9.9. 9. And the reason I want to do that is in, in the Gospel of Matthew, or, yeah, Matthew, excuse me, uh, he also covers the triumphal entry as well. But Matthew's really keen about making sure that the Old Testament prophecies are tied to what Jesus was doing. Okay? And so let's read Zechariah 9.9 9 and see why Matthew would have, have resourced that. And it says in Zechariah 9.9, 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation as he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So Jesus is fulfilling this prophecy that was way back you know, in, in Zechariah's time. And, and, and it represents... You know, him coming in humbly. He's not coming in to conquer, right? He's not coming in to take over the Roman government. He's coming in humbly, and he's coming in as a king, right? So that's, that's an image I just want you guys to see. With the triumphal entry, Jesus is saying, I have arrived. Your king is here, right? And not only is he saying that, but he's saying the Messiah. And for those Jewish folks, they, would, they, they knew their scriptures. They kind of, they were prepared for it. They were ready for it. But Messiah means anointed one, means the one that God had sent. Okay? So he's saying, I am coming as the promised king, as the Messiah. Now the people really know what's going on here, and I'm, I'm not going to read all the verses, I'm kind of paraphrasing for you, but they knew how to honor. They put coats down. Right? They put coats on the, on the, col on the colt, uh, I'm sorry, the donkey, and Jesus got on that, they put coat, uh, colts on the road, and then they cut down um, tree leaves, right? And they laid them down. And so if you have not been at our service on Palm Sunday, I'd, I mean, for those of you who have been there, you know it's, it's pretty awesome. We will do a demonstration of that. We're not going to do that today because it's not Palm Sunday. But, so don't miss it. You know, it's, it's, again, it's the Sunday before Easter. Pretty easy to remember. Okay, so that's coming next year, 2020. But they really knew that Jesus was coming. They knew that the Messiah was there, and they were prepared. And, and, and they welcomed him in. Right? It wasn't like Jesus came in, they're like, oh man, let's go get ready. They were ready and waiting. They were prepared. You know, and, and when I think about things like that, I'm just wondering, how did the people know? You know, how did they know that he was coming? And, and I guess we'll talk about that in a minute. I, I want to I wanna continue reading in verse 9 and 10. And it says, And those who went before, this is the procession of Jesus, and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And so, you know, whenever we sing that song, Hosanna, you know, that it's tied to that scripture. 
And, you know, Hosanna is an interesting word because it, it basically says, it, it kind of has two meanings, but the primary one is save now. Like, save us now. They're crying out to God, we need to be saved. <laughs> so they know something about them, you know, themselves that they need a Savior. They need someone to be saved. And, and they were kind of slightly in a different um, arena than us because they were under oppression. You know, they were God's chosen people, but they didn't have their own nation. They were under Roman rule, right? They were, they were basically exiled. And so they, they were wanting kind of their independence. They were wanting a savior. They were wanting a king, a conquering king to come. And they had a vision of that, but God's, Jesus' mission was slightly different than what they were expecting. <clears throat> and Hosanna can also mean, and you'll see it in some of the other scriptures, it could also mean um, praise. It's just a way to praise. But the primary um, use of Hosanna is to say, save us. Um, and so that's what they were doing. And, and just as we were talking about how Zechariah had prophesied that the king would come on a donkey. Well, when they were saying Hosanna, they were actually citing a, a messianic psalm. And all that means is a psalm that was predicting the Messiah, predicting the, the, the one that would come. And, and this is Psalm 118, 25 to 26. And it says, Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. And if you hear that, that sounds very similar to what we just read in Mark um, 9 and 10. And so the, the, the people, they, they were expecting Jesus to come. And you know, when I, when I think about that, like, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for you and I? And, and you know, and it, it just makes me ask the question, do we know that we need to be saved? You know, is there, is there something in our heart that kind of says, you know what, we're not right unless God's in it. Right, that there's something that God offers that we can't, we can't do ourselves. And, you know, just from a, a really high level, if you go all the way back to Genesis, you have the garden of Adam and Eve. And, you know, that first sin, as a people, we've inherited their sin nature. So just by birth, we are separated from God. We didn't necessarily do anything wrong, per se, but it's just, it's, it's a sin nature that we inherited. And so we start off not in God's family, if you will. And then, you know, again, if we spend time in church and reading the Bible, we will know that, like Paul tells us in Romans, no one is righteous on their own. Everybody needs God. Every single person. No matter how good they appear to other people, even compared to other people, everyone needs God. And those are, you know, those are just some of the things. And then eventually we'll realize, reading through John's gospel, that Jesus is the only way. There is no other way to get to God through, except through Jesus. And here's the thing is, ultimately God, he leaves the choice to us. We have to decide. Is God who he says he is or is he not? Is he the one that gives me salvation or doesn't he? Or, you know, can, do I have, can I earn my way into God? And he, he really, what he does, uh, honestly, is he gives us what we want. Do we want to be with God? We can choose his sacrifice. If we don't want to be with God, well, then we can choose the consequences of not being with God. He doesn't force us one way or the other. <laughs> But what I also find is fascinating, in, in addition to just, do we need to be saved, but are we, like, if, like in this situation, God had come, Jesus had come as the Messiah on the, you know, on this horse, and if I was there, would I know that that was the Messiah coming? You know, and basically the question I'm asking is, would I be prepared, was I, would I know what to look for when God is on the move, when he's doing things? You know, what are those, what would those things be, you know, and, and I just, I'm just thinking about, well, if I was going to be prepared, I would have to spend time looking for God. I would have to be hungry for Him. I would have to know like what God is about and what does He care about and what are the things that He does and He says. And I really would have to spend time getting to know Him. I would have to spend time in His Word. I would have to spend time with His people, with His church. And you know, I would need to expect that He's going to show up, that He's, he's going to be where I need Him to be. And then when he does show up, I need to be like these people and actually praise him and tell him, God, I need you. Save me. <laughs> right? Save us. Hosanna. I need to respond uh, to what he's up to. So, you know, and, and here's the thing, too, and I know we, we can't, it's hard to put ourselves in that time and place, but even all the things that he did, people still rejected Jesus. They still did not want to follow him. And to this day, you know, God's chosen people uh, you know, traditional Jewish folks still don't believe he has come, right? They're still waiting for Elijah. They're still waiting for the prophet. They don't believe that Jesus is it. And, uh, you know, my goal is not to convince them one way or the other. 
But I think Jesus has given a lot of evidence as to why he would be that person. Uh, but it's it's between them and God. And if there's anything I'm supposed to do, I would love to do that. But but they actually had good reasons to reject him, believe it or not. Um, you know, Jesus claimed to be God. And that was kind of a blasphemy. That was kind of, that was something you didn't do, right? You're putting yourself above people. You're making yourself equal with God, and that's not acceptable. And Jesus did his miracles on the Sabbath. That was totally against the commandments. That was not how they were trained, how they were raised. And, and again, by forgiving sins, that was another thing that he did that would just turn them off or it would force them to really search in their hearts. Um, but, you know, we also have good reasons for not accepting Jesus too. <laughs> and so some of it is, you know, like maybe we have prayers that he doesn't answer. Or maybe, you know, we said, hey, God, I really need you to move in this area of my life and he doesn't. I mean, that could, that could turn us away. And sometimes you look at your life and you go, would God, if God really loved me, would my life be like this? Like, would this be my situation? And I know for me, uh, you know, I, I, for those of you guys that know me, I didn't grow up in the church. I didn't, you know, I had my family, I had my kids, I had my career. I had everything I needed, and I didn't, and God was not part of the picture. So I had no motivation to include God into that. And we'll talk a little bit later about some of the things he just, you know, he did in my life to get my attention. But I was totally happy without it, you know. And, um, and I don't know if there's people in your life that are like that too. But I just want you to know, have hope, have faith. <laughs> Keep praying for them because I know a lot of people prayed for me. And they prayed in a way that got my attention to, to spend time with God. But, you know, not only did, they, did, did the Jewish folks and, and us have reasons to not receive Jesus, but they actually had a lot of good reasons to accept him as Jesus too. So remember, it's not just a one-sided story. I mean, they literally saw him heal people. They saw him raise people from the dead. And they saw how he taught and the authority that he brought. And they, they, they just have to think, where does that come from? <laughs> that's, not, that's not something you just learn. That's something that's, that's, that's given to you. That's something that's above people. And, you know, uh, for us, too, why, why would we accept Jesus? I mean, he literally died for you. I mean, if somebody died for you, at least pay attention, right? Just say, why, why would you die for me? You know, what's going on here, right? <laughs> but, but seriously, he laid down his life for us, for everybody. And, <laughs> you know, he forgives us, too. I mean, I don't know about you, but sometimes, and I don't think this is biblical, so, but I just know I, it happens, is I think sometimes we don't even know how to forgive ourselves, you know? But God forgives us. He said, look, I give you the, I'll give you the out. Come back. Say you're sorry. That you, you know, you can promise not to do again, but, you know, whether you will or not, that's up to you. But he literally is asking you, come back, be humble. Ask for forgiveness. Change your ways. He's, he's not saying just go do, do wrong and say, you know, say apology. Go do wrong, say apology. Even though we won't be perfect. But he is saying come back and change your ways. Be humble in your heart. And I just love that. And he, and he loves us and that we're his creation. And you know, when I think about how God, you know, because we're talking, the, the title of this message is Making Your Mark. Well, part of ma us making our mark is how, how has God made a mark on us, right? And so I just think about how, is, how has God made a mark on me? How has he impressed upon me? Besides all the things we've already mentioned. But I just love that he's available. Like, it, I don't have to come to him only on Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, and he has a lunch break between 12 and 1, right? There's not all this limited time window. It's like anywhere, anytime, God is available. And I just love that about him. And, you know, he shows up. <laughs> he is faithful. He will show up. And, man, does he love unconditionally. He just loves. And, you know, for me personally, when I made that decision uh, to follow God, it was just a simple prayer that a, a preacher had, had preached on a Sunday morning. And I just felt like I, I don't have to be con in control of everything in my life anymore. I don't have to be the one that has all the answers. You know, I was, I was fearful of losing, losing my job because I provided for my family. And if I didn't have my job, how do I provide for my family? And man, he just took away all of that pressure that I had put on myself. I'm just so thankful that he does that. And on top of that, I just, in addition to just <laughs> him being in control, is I felt uh, covered. I felt protected. I didn't feel like I had to defend myself from everything. I didn't have to know everything. I can go to him, and I can be honest with him. And so those are just some of the ways that Jesus made a mark on me. So really, you know, the thing I want you guys to reflect on is, we have to really decide, is Jesus the anointed one? Is he my savior? Is he your savior? And I know for those of you guys who have been around the church a long time, you, you probably made that decision, and you're very confident in that. And I pray that that's true. 
Uh, but there may be people who have not been at church much, and you don't, you don't even know that that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to allow Jesus into your life. And, and essentially, um, what I love about this is, you know, Jesus made a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. That was basically the heart and soul of where he came, his religion, um, you know, where God showed up. And, and he came and he did it publicly. He said, I am here as the king, as the Messiah. But you know, he can also make a triumphal entry into our hearts too. Okay, and that's the moment we decide we're going to surrender to him and we're going to allow him to be the king and the anointed one in, inside of us. And so my prayer is that you would seriously consider that if you have not. Uh, but he literally came to save you. And uh, just briefly touching, uh, to, to kind of wrap up the triumphal entry, in verse 11 it says that he entered Jerusalem and he went into the temple and when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany uh, to the, with the twelve, excuse me. So that's just a little foreshadowed. Some of those details are just kind of interesting because he went into the temple, but he didn't do anything yet. Because the next day, we're going to have some fun in the temple, but we're not there yet, okay? So, um, so he goes on, and then he's, he's kind of expecting some things. We're, we're kind of, I'm going to read um, a little bit, you know, into the, to the fig tree. Well, it says Jesus, and I'm going to summarize, Jesus was hungry, and he saw a fig tree, and it had leaves on it, so he was expecting it to have fruit, right? He wanted to, he wanted to, um, to take of that fruit, but there was nothing on it. And in verse 14, he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Now, this is kind of interesting, because you really don't see a lot of Jesus attacking things, especially a plant, you know? So, because um, they, you know, it's not like, uh, a, it's not a human eater or anything, but there's some there's like two lessons from this one is there's kind of there's an idea of this is symbolism of god's chosen people of israel of how they on the outside they look like they were fruitful but they really weren't you know there's that um but the, the part i'm going to focus on today is there's a faith lesson in there and we're going to touch on it in just a moment so uh you guys remember i was talking about this is the passion week this is uh jesus getting ready to do the ultimate sacrifice for us um and part of that is it's all tied to the passover Okay, so as we talk about the Passover, I wanted to just get us get our hearts a little bit ready for that and what what that is, and you know, and this brings us all the way back to the Old Testament. You know, when God's chosen people, when they were slaves in Egypt, and God did those twelve. Um, um, excuse me, not twelve. He did ten plagues, uh, and so where I'm going to flip to is I'm going to go to Exodus twelve, and because that's where the uh, the actual scriptures are, and you don't have to turn there. I'm going to read to you. Okay, but the whole point, if you guys remember, is that God's chosen people, they were in slavery, and the Pharaoh would not let them go. Okay, so I'm going to give you some instructions. So in verse 1 it says, And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because those were the leaders at that time, In the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be... Um, hey, what's going on there? Uh, why are you carrying that water bottle? <laughs> well, this is a nice shortcut through the sanctuary to get water instead of going all the way around. Okay, well, you know, I realize it's hot outside, but do you mind, can we just do that after service? Oh. Okay. Okay, sorry. All right, thanks. Yeah, just go ahead and head out that way. Okay, thanks. So, in the, you know, in preparation of the Exodus, yeah, sorry, sorry the, uh, Moses and Aaron were talking, you know, and they said that it should be in the first of the year. And he says to tell all of the congregation... On the tenth day of the month. What were you going to talk to me about? Every man. I'm concerned. The fact is that he, uh, he was everything okay over there, guys. At services more. You guys hear what they're talking about? I haven't seen him for a while. I haven't seen him either. Hey guys, how's it going? So was, oh, oh, no, it was, but I was concerned because he used to be a regular every Sunday. Every Sunday he was showing up. Yeah. All of a sudden, for the last month and a half, two months, he kind of like disappeared, like he hasn't shown up. Have, you, so have I mean, you talked to him? I haven't talked to him. And, uh, All right. Well, okay, guys. You know, thanks I, for, um, I really am uh, happy that you guys are worried about some of our church members. Maybe we haven't seen in a while. But I don't yeah. think this may not be. Oh, yeah, actually, have you guys have, called have them? You seen them? Have you guys called them? Or, no, okay. No. Actually, this isn't really a good time I haven't for that. called them. Like, if, I think I should have. If you don't mind, can I have you guys just stand over there for a moment? Oh, yeah. And, oh, and if you could, yeah, just maybe keep yeah, it down. We'll okay, yeah, we're trying to do a service here. Okay. All right. Now, remember, in preparation of the Passover, it was on the tenth day of the month that every man shall take a lamb according to their father's house, a lamb for a household. 
and in verse 4, and if the household is too small for a lamb, and he and his hey, nearest neighbor... Oh, hey, yeah. How's it going? Good, good. How, how are you doing, Steve? Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, nice to see you. Yeah. <laughs> you know I read the Bible once a year, right? Yeah, that's... Yeah, the Bible's a great book. Okay, excellent. Yeah, and me and God are great partners, and uh, he's really helpful. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's pretty awesome. Okay, you know, I'm really glad that you... You really dedicate, you know, time to God's word. But okay. I'm kind of curious. Do you know what we're talking about right now? And uh, not really. <laughs> why, uh, uh, why would that be? I don't know. Uh, but I was distracted by that guy over there that was carrying the water bottle and those guys are oh, talking about the there. people that aren't in church. Oh, okay. I see. Okay. Well, all right. Well, what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to get back to Exodus 12 and the Passover. So just go ahead and stand over there and just try to pay attention so you don't miss anything. Okay. Okay. I want you to, okay good. All right. <laughs> Now, if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each you can eat. You should. Buy me some peanuts and Hey, uh, how, how's it going there, Bill? Hi, how are you, Russell? I'm doing fine. Uh, I'm so excited about our sports town. We have so much going on here, man, with the Dodgers and the Saints and the and the Rams are playing today. It's going to be so exciting, man. I can't wait. I've got my stuff here all ready to go, right? Yeah. And well. guess what? We can watch it right here on the screens. Yeah. We've got these big screens and we got that one in the back. We won't miss one play. All right. Would that be wonderful? You definitely have come with a plan. I really appreciate yeah. that. You yeah. know, you... <laughs> You bring sports to a whole new level, you know, and uh, did I see you on your phone right there yeah. too? Okay, you're taking that. Okay. I'm checking All right. it out. Well, Get here's, ready. Here's what I'm going to do. Uh, we'll, we're going to run this service, and then once we're done, I promise you can watch all the games you want, but you do want to check with your wife first, okay, because she needs to kind of be a part of that. And so if you don't mind, could you just go over there and try not to be loud with those guys? Yeah, just, go over there with them? Yeah, yeah, just go over there. Yeah, yeah. Just, Take it easy. Yeah. All right. You know, okay. Now, uh, did you see that guy with his phone? The kids and the technology these days is crazy. Okay. So, now remember, this lamb is going to be a sacrifice in verse 5. And your lamb shall be without blemish, a male one year old. And you may take it from the sheep or the goats. And it shall be until the 14th day of the month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Okay, so we're getting an image here of how the lamb is very important in the Passover. And uh, how's it going there? Hi. So uh, what, what are you doing with uh, making noises and stuff? Uh, I have international coins, and I'd like to sell them or exchange them. I got pesos, euros, dollars, shekels. In fact, this is for the Guatemala trip. Is that okay? All right. Well, I kind of sense that maybe you're being a little bit, you know, sneaky here with trying to sell stuff at church. Is that what you're trying to do? Oh, I, I didn't know this was church. Oh, you didn't know this was church? Okay. Well, look, let me go ahead and have you stand over there with those guys. Okay. okay. Now, seriously, guys, I've really been trying to teach you guys about the Passover, and these guys are not helping at all. Okay, so guys, listen, you guys, you really are going to have to keep it down. Dan, you especially, okay? So, look, here's the thing. We're all here trying to gather together to learn about, you know, the Passover and the triumphal entry. And Jesus is about to do something really important right now, okay? And I, I'm just, I'm, I'm getting upset. It's kind of like this holy, righteous anger. And I don't know, I just feel like I need to flip a table or something, okay? So listen. It's a lot of money, okay? Now listen. This is serious, though. We've all come here to connect with God. Okay, and you guys all have important stuff that you're talking about, but it's distracting us from what we're doing today. Okay, so I'm just going to ask you a question. Are you guys okay with calming down and having a seat? Because otherwise, I'm going to really have to ask you guys to leave. Okay, you guys good with that? Now, when it comes, when it comes to Jesus in Mark 10, Mark 11, he said that his house would be a house of prayer for all the nations. Okay, and the reason that's important is because when you think about the church, and how the temple, how it was set up, there was kind of general areas, and then it would become more and more exclusive, okay? So one area you would have is the court of the Gentiles, and that's where everybody could come. And in the scripture, we're not going to necessarily read it right now, but that was a place where they were selling uh, sheep, they were selling doves, they were exchanging money, and they were doing all of this in the setting where everyone could be. And Jesus was not having it, right? He was not happy about that. Because there's, there's another part where there's, they call it like the court of women, if you will, but you had to be Jewish to get in there. It could be men or women. But the Gentiles couldn't come into that part of the church. 
and I would probably bet my life on it, they were not selling sheep and doves and money changing in there, right? Because that was, it was serious. You're coming to, to meet with God. And then to be even more exclusive than the next section would be where the men could be. So this would be the Jewish men. So the women couldn't come to that part of the, the area of the temple. And then beyond that, there was another part of the temple where the priest could go. And then finally, the Holy of Holies is where the, the priest would go once a year on behalf of all of the people, right? And he would, uh, he would pray and, and um, you know, call out for, just for God to move in the land. And so this court of the Gentiles was where everyone could be. And as we were sitting there going through what we just experienced, did you guys have a little bit of trouble focusing on what I was talking about, about the Passover and Exodus? Okay. And see, because this is the heart of God is he will do, he wants everyone to come to him. It says he'll be a house of prayer for all of the nations. It's not just for his chosen people, right, Israel. It's for all of the nations. And so anything that gets in the way of us connecting with God, he's going to do what he can to remove that. Okay? And so that's where the, the temple cleansing comes in, is he, he did not want all of that ruckus around. He wanted people to come to the temple. He wanted people to come to church so they can connect with God in the way that they need to be connected. Didn't want all of this... Um, shenanigans going on, right? All this busyness, all of this stuff that's doing everything except kind of focusing on God and, uh, and connecting people. And so I'm going to flip back here to Mark 11. So we have that. And so he literally overturned the tables. He was cleansing the temple. You know, and I, um, I don't know if you guys have, have had anything like this, but I, I try to reflect and say, have I ever had anger in my life? And, uh, and then I think, uh, yeah, right? <laughs> I've been angry. And have I done it in the right way? Where I'm uh, angry probably about the wrong things and, uh, you know, uh, in the wrong way. And, you know, like steaming hot anger where you just can't think about anything because you're just so angry and you just, you want to act out of it. But ha have I had times where I've had holy, righteous anger? like a godly anger in me. And maybe I've had more than I can think of, but just two, two kind of thoughts came to my mind. And one was, I was doing this youth leader training thing, which um, <laughs> it was a Christian thing. It was, it was actually good. It was at a great church. But they honestly spent probably like 10 minutes talking about wine and sommeliers and all this kind of stuff. And I just tell you, every minute that went on, I was like, I'm here to learn about God, not about wine. <laughs> I don't care if you can smell something and you know it's made out of tea leaves or whatever. You know, I don't care about that stuff. But they made it. They did a good job of connecting just the, um, the intensity that comes in terms of if you truly want to get to know God, you will be an expert in God, right? You will really pursue that. So I, I like how they finished it. But man, as that was going, I was, uh, I was getting hot and I, I feel like it was a holy anger, uh, but I could be wrong. And this might be a slightly different interpretation of that, but I've had, you know, we have, sometimes we have tough meetings at church. Um, we, we generally don't try to do that or don't like that, but, but we, I remember having this one tough meeting, and I wasn't necessarily angry, so I don't, this may be a bad example, but I, I just, I got to see, witness firsthand the power of, of sin and the damage and the havoc it creates on people, you know, when they're just beaten down and bruised and, and just how it, uh, how it, it rears its ugly head, if you will. And so, so for me, I was, I was angry at the power of sin. I don't know if that makes sense to you guys. But I was really upset about how this person was kind of just being toyed with by the devil. And it, would just, it was burning. And so I think there's a holy righteous anger that, that we can have. And, and, and really what it, what it kind of what it boils down to is why are we angry and what are we going to do with that anger? If we take that anger and we, and we bring it to the spiritual realm and we say, you know what, God, you, you need to do something here. We need to take authority over this, right? Um, so it's not, it's not about getting even with anything. It's not about doing what we want. It's, it's about doing what God wants and what his kingdom would want. So uh, those are just, uh, you know, just some things that we would want to consider. And, you know, it does, it does beg the question for me, if Jesus came to our church, would he have some temple cleansing to do? And I would tell you, uh, I would hope he wouldn't come in flipping tables. <laughs> Hopefully we're better than that. I, I don't know, you know, but I do think we can all get better in terms of our walk with God, right? There's always things that, that we can improve. And so I, I would expect he, would, he wouldn't come in leaving us the same, <laughs> right? He would, he would do some good, good work in us, I believe. But, but, you know, there's a scripture that says our, our body is a temple, you know, that Paul tells us in uh, 1 Corinthians. And so... 
you know, if we really want to make this personal, we want to think about, has Jesus cleansed our temple? You know, has, has he come in in places and turned over the tables where he needs to? You know, we, um, we actually do have the power to decide whether we want to let God in or not, let him move in us or not. And, you know, I think one of the awesome things about being a Christian, it doesn't matter where we are, God meets us right where we're at. He doesn't say get better. He doesn't say stop doing that. He doesn't say start doing that. He says, look, right where you are, that's where I want to meet you. But he doesn't leave us there, right? He has a place for us to go. Our temple is not in order, <laughs> right? Our temple needs to be searched. It needs to be cleansed. It needs to be renewed. It needs to be rebuilt. Uh, it needs to be made new, if you will. So anywhere in our lives that blocks us from Jesus and connecting with him, those are tables that need to be turned over. Those are places that he needs to get to. And, you know, when I first became a Christian, I mean, seriously, I knew zero about the Bible. I knew just a little bit about God because I heard some sermons. You know, I've been to church a little bit. I saw what Christians do. You know, I had some ideas. But, you know, just some subtle things. Like he started just asking me, like, well, what about the music you listen to? Is that honoring me or is that not honoring me? You know? The movies that you watch, the TV shows that you watch, does that bring me closer to God or does that bring me further away from God? You know, and, and you know, you, those are areas that God may or may not be speaking to you, but that's, that's kind of where he started with me. And, uh, you know, I know we, we made a little fun of the sports stuff, but before I became a Christian, Sunday was not about church for me, <laughs> right? <laughs> Sunday is about something else, you know, and, um, you know, and, and a lot of something else, right? So... And all I mean by that is just, uh, you know, watching games all day long and, and stuff. And so that was just something he nudged in my heart. Like, I, I prefer to be around God life-giving and sacrificing that time. And so for all your football plans, you know, God bless you. You know, maybe he's talking to you, maybe he's not. Okay, but that's, that's just where I was. I'm not here to, con you know, I'm not here to convict you in that way. I'm just here for you to ask God, is that a table in my life that needs to be turned? Uh, but I know for guys, sports is a big one. So, or it can be. But the reality is we got to come to God and be willing to ask him, what do you want me to change for you? What, what is in my life that needs to be changed? And if you don't know, ask him, right? What is he asking you to change? All right, so we've, we've experienced a triumphal entry, and there was just a brief period where Jesus cursed that fig tree, and we got a little taste of what it's like to cleanse the temple, right? What it's like to be distracted from hearing God's word. And so we're going to continue on into... <coughs> Uh, verses 26 to 20, uh, excuse me, 20 to 26. So I want to read uh, to you just a couple of things. So, so Peter, they come and they see that fig tree, and then Peter notices um, in verse 21, he says, Look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them in verse 22, Have faith in God. Verse 23, Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass and it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone so that your father also who is in heaven may forgive you and your trespasses. Now what, uh, I, I want to just clarify a little bit of that. But when we truly can come to God and we pray him for things and we don't have doubt, that's a very powerful prayer. Okay, now we, doubt is part of faith, so I'm not saying you're not going to doubt. I'm not, I'm not saying you have to be perfect in that way. But when you just know that God is going to do what he says he can do, and you can trust in that, that's, there's just a solid faith. And for those of you guys who know my journey, when I had a serious health issue, I don't know what it was, but my faith level was the highest it's ever been. At the, at the very same time, my fear and scared level was at the very highest it's ever been, too. I can't explain to it, I just experienced it, okay? And I hope you don't necessarily have to go through that, but I do hope that your faith level would be rock solid. But I know for me, it took times like that where it was, it was something I didn't want to experience. It wasn't something I wanted to do. I didn't choose that, right? It just, it happened. But it was a, it was a time where God said, well, are you going to choose me or are you going to figure it out on your own? And I just felt like I needed to keep choosing him. Keep choosing him. And it was simple stuff, like... I didn't want to tell my kids, right? Like, I wasn't feeling well. So just like, you know, that's what the devil does. He likes to make you hide. He likes to make go in the dark, right? Just don't get help. Figure it out on your own. And, you know, uh, Christianity is not about being a lone ranger, right? It's not about being Jesus on yourself. It's, a, it, it's about a relationship. 
It's about a family, a church family. It's about a community. It's about knowing that you don't have the answer or power to solve it yourself. But you do have a God that, that can do it. And it was just uh, things like that. And asking for prayer from the church. Asking for prayer from the elders. Just asking. Just knowing that I can't do it on my own. And, you know, God willing, he just, he blessed me with good health. And, you know, he took care of everything through a surgery. And I was just, just amazed by it. But I also, I just want to caution you too. The way that reads, it kind of sounds like whatever you pray for, you're going to get. And I don't want you to hear that. <laughs> Okay, you pray in God's will, you pray for God's kingdom, for what God wants to do, okay, then, then that's the right prayer. Because I still have a prayer. I've been praying this since I was a kid. Well, I, I stopped praying it, but I wanted an ATV, a three-wheeler. I still haven't gotten it yet, okay? I think God still loves me, right? But I'm not praying for the right things, right? I'm just praying for selfish, fun things that I want. Um, but man, when, when your prayer is serious, sincere, excuse me, and it's serious, and it's for what, what we need, right? It's what God wants to move through. That's the kind of prayer we're talking about. Okay, and to wrap up this chapter, um, believe it or not, the, the Pharisees, you know, and the scribes and the religious leaders, chief priests, they are just not done with Jesus. They want to catch him, and they want to corner him with a question that he can't answer. And they just still have not figured out they can't do that. But they still try. So, you know, they, um, they come to Jesus with a question. This is towards the end of chapter tw uh, 11, excuse me. It says, when they came, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to jump down to verse 28. And he, he basically is just asking Jesus, they're asking him, by what authority are you doing these things in terms of the miracles and the teaching and the healings, all the things that he's doing? And who gave you this authority or who gave you this authority to do them? Because Jesus knows that they really don't want to know the truth. They're just really trying to be sneaky. They're trying to disqualify him. They're trying to get him out. Um, remember, the, the pressure is mounting. They, you know, like if they could just get Jesus to walk away, that'd probably be the easiest. I mean, that's that's my guess of what they're doing here. But they're just really trying to make Jesus look bad, and they continually make themselves look bad. But it, so he just returns the question with a question, which is a good way to do things, uh, especially in Jesus's um, thing. He said, "Well, okay." So he, Jesus kind of knew that they did not receive or understand the baptism of John, John the Baptist, and so he just asked them, "Well, what do you think? Where did where John get his authority from?" Like, was that from man or from heaven? So basically, was that God-ordained? Did God bring John to do that? Or did he just do, you know, did he just do that on his own? And, and they, you know, it talks about the reasoning. They knew that if they said from heaven, then they would kind of have to agree with what Jesus was doing. But if they said from man, then all the people would be mad because they knew the people were going to John and he was um, blessing them and he was getting set free. So they basically said, we do not know. Right? That was their answer. So he's basically turned the question on him. But I think I want to, what I'll leave you with that is that Jesus, his authority comes from God. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to bring up the uh, worship team. And uh, we're going we're gonna to prepare for communion.